Hey guys, Tyler here. The TARDIS is the iconic spacecraft and time machine that appears in the British sci-fi series Doctor Who. The main TARDIS that we see throughout the show resembles a 1960s London police box and belongs to the show's protagonist, a Time Lord from the planet Gallifrey who goes by the name the Doctor. The primary vehicle of choice for Time Lords traveling across the cosmos, TARDISes are known for being dimensionally transcendental. That is, they are bigger on the inside than the outside, containing infinite rooms, corridors, and storage spaces that can all change their appearance. TARDISes are also known for being self-aware and having personalities of their own. The paradoxical nature of TARDISes construction and operation has made them a go-to example of engineering beyond our wildest imaginations by manipulating the fabric of space-time itself. In today's video, I'll attempt to answer the question, how could somebody build something that's bigger on the inside than the outside? Let's find out. According to at least one account, dimensional engineering was perfected by the inhabitants of Gallifrey in ancient times. The first time ships to be equipped with this dimension-bending technology, Type 1 TARDISes, were very dangerous and difficult to operate. Eventually, the scale and configuration of rooms within a TARDIS could be controlled from the inside or the outside by sliding cursors on centralized panels. A TARDIS's flight light deck can be contained anywhere within the TARDIS, and it's this room where the control console interfaces with the TARDIS's other internal systems. The TARDIS is often compared to an entrance chamber to the fourth dimension, and the vehicle's dimension shifting capabilities are the result of quote unquote reverse time acceleration just beyond its inner door. Therefore, all but the box are invisible to the outside world. A series of dimensional dams keep the ever-changing interior contained within the outer plasmic shell, and a failure of these dimensional dams is called a size leak. By default, a TARDIS exterior looks like a plain gray column with a sliding door, but in a functioning TARDIS, within a nanosecond of landing in a new location, a so-called chameleon circuit analyzes the surrounding thousand-mile radius and chooses an outer shell to best blend with the environment. A subsystem called architectural configuration controls a TARDIS's ability to move around and delete rooms. It can additionally provide momentum should a TARDIS need to escape a threat, presumably by the manipulation of gravitational energy. TARDISes have a failsafe to prevent them from deleting themselves, and they are equipped with defenses to protect against intruders and attackers. Something else that is important to keep in mind is that TARDISes are technically sentient machines. A TARDIS's consciousness is referred to as an 11th dimensional matrix folded into something mechanical. It's said that TARDISes are grown rather than constructed due to their immense complexity. There's even a time travel growth capsule foundry on Gallifrey. One source claims that TARDISes require a morphologically unstable sample of organic matter, a protoplasm of sorts, to perform calculations, kind of like Star Trek Voyager's bioneural circuitry. Before a TARDIS is fully functional, it must be primed with the symbiotic nuclei of a Time Lord's cells in order to create a stable system for its occupants. The Tenth Doctor speaks of his TARDIS's mechanical difficulties in medical and biological terms, and every Doctor has considered her alive like a person. TARDISes can communicate non-verbally, disobey orders if they think them unwise. I'm sorry, Dave, I'm afraid I can't do that. And even mourn the loss of their Time Lord pilots by flying themselves into stars or time vortexes. Yeah. Okay, that's how a TARDIS functions in the show. But surely in real life, this kind of technology is completely out of reach for a civilization like our own, right? Well, at the moment, 
the answer to that question is a resounding yes, absolutely. And it will probably continue to be a resounding yes for centuries, even millennia to come, if we ever even get that advanced. But just as with the warp drive in Star Trek, there's definitely a theoretical basis for the concept of folding space. In fact, space folding is already real. That's how gravity works. Curved space is indeed a technical term for any spatial geometry that is not flat, as described by Euclidean geometry. In other words, most of the universe, as we've found, tends not to curve in on itself, meaning it may be infinite, and is thus referred to as homogeneous. It's also generally isotropic, meaning it has identical properties in all directions. One of the biggest places where both of these traits break down is just beyond the event horizon of black holes, whose true nature continues to confound scientists to this very day. But even a regular star, a simple planet, or a meager moon also exerts its own gravitational influence albeit increasingly smaller. Actually, everything in the universe exerts some gravitational influence. Human beings, elephants, mice, chairs, tea kettles, soccer balls, etc. This curvature of space-time, particularly by large spherical objects throughout the universe, plays an essential role in Einstein's theory of general relativity. Under this theory, gravity acts not merely as a force in the Newtonian sense, but as a consequence of curved space-time geometry caused by an uneven distribution of mass. Gravity thus causes masses to move along so-called geodesics, or straight lines on a curved surface. For example, lines of latitude and longitude are two-dimensional geodesics on the Earth's surface, and an orbit of a planet around a star is a projection of a curved four-dimensional geodesic onto our familiar three-dimensional space. What does this have to do with the TARDIS? Well, we're getting there. Beyond just understanding how gravity functions, key to this connection is understanding how gravity originated. Current models of particle physics suggest that gravity may have emerged alongside normal space and time mere moments after the Big Bang. It may have emerged from a primordial state such as the so-called quantum vacuum, a state of measurement of a system with the lowest possible energy. In practice, the quantum vacuum can be used to describe things like the ground state of electromagnetic fields. But as physicists would also point out, the quantum vacuum is anything but empty space. Indeed, the quantum vacuum contains fleeting electromagnetic waves, as well as what are called virtual particles, quantum fluctuations that exhibit the properties of ordinary particles. These virtual particles can have varying masses and pop in and out of existence very quickly. Virtual particles are fundamental to physical processes like the Casimir effect, in which two metal plates placed nanometers apart in a vacuum can seem to spontaneously come together. They do this because virtual particles with wavelengths wider than the separation of the plates generate a net attractive force that pushes them together. Depending on the arrangement of the plates, they can also be made to repel each other. Either way, some physicists believe that the Casimir vacuum can be exploited to fulfill the negative energy requirements for things like a faster-than-light engine. By taking advantage of these quantum effects, a faster-than-light engine could fold space-time, contracting space in front of a ship while expanding space behind it, to traverse colossal distances in more reasonable time frames. Of course, we're still a very, very long way from ever being able to construct something like this. Even testing is probably still years or decades too advanced for us. But again, the theoretical basis for creating a warp or fold in space-time, in my opinion, is quite well established. Folding space to make an object bigger on the inside than the outside is still, of course, a huge step beyond just merely harnessing gravitational energy. 
But even today, some of the math behind theoretical faster-than-light engines makes room for backwards time travel. While a unified theory of quantum mechanics and general relativity may indeed prevent such causality-breaking effects, some physicists believe that the very nature of quantum mechanics itself could provide the answers we're looking for. The TARDIS's 11th dimensional matrix could also be referenced to a particular variety of string theory, which posits the existence of 10 spatial dimensions and one time dimension, connecting the multiverse. Beyond the normal four dimensions that we normally deal with, three axes of movement and the linear progression of time, these extra dimensions would in fact be compactified to form a mathematically finite model for the observable universe. Thus, our 4D space-time would be a subspace of higher dimensional space. Such extra degrees of freedom are inaccessible to us, but the TARDIS can access them. By harnessing the power of the quantum vacuum, TARDISes and other spacecraft and time machines can manipulate the very fabric of space-time itself to traverse it just like driving a car down the street. And string theory can also provide an explanation for the TARDIS's ability to make its inside bigger than its outside, using extra dimensions to store and access additional rooms. While on a separate note, the mechanics of time travel might deserve a video of their own, hopefully this video has been an informative look at how the TARDIS functions and how it relates to real-world theoretical physics. Oh yeah, and as for why the TARDIS makes that sound that it makes? Well, as River Song once claimed, it's not supposed to make that sound because it comes from the doctor leaving the brakes on. Thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, are in the description. That's all I have for this week. I'll see you next time. Thank you.